going to get started with our second panel, uh, which is focused on using your skills, marketing your skill set, in other words, using your sk writing skills in business. And we have on our panel, actually, two entrepreneurs who are in the, pro you know, to hire, and two people who have actually applied and gotten jobs that are writing related. And so our questions today are going to kind of uh, focus on what employers are looking for and how employees or potential employees can get matched up with the best jobs. Um, introductions are in order, of course. I'm Judy Blunt. I teach creative nonfiction at the University of Montana. And um, I've worked a number of jobs, almost none of which required writing, except for that of university professor and I get to scribble a whole lot of nasty comments in the margins of student papers and that's my writing skill right now. Um, we have uh, Brian Morgan to my near left. He's a lifelong resident of Montana and a graduate of the UM English program. In his early 20s he lived in Moscow and then in Ecuador. He founded Adventure Life 17 adventure life 17 years ago to share his travel experience with others interested in the world's most off the beaten path places. Since then, his company has grown to serve more than 3,500 travelers each year with 23 full-time staff in Missoula. Adventure Life has been nationally recognized for its outstanding itineraries in such places as the New York Times, USA Today, National Geographic Traveler, and more. Outside Magazine has repeatedly listed Adventure Life as one of the best places to work in the U.S. Next, we... <laughs> I don't have you in order here. <laughs> Next, we have Caitlin Hoffmeister. Um, she's a producer, director, and occasional host of SciShow, which is a trio of educational YouTube series about science. She has a BA in creative writing and philosophy from Linfield College and an MFA in media arts and digital filmmaking from the University of Montana. Asta So was born in Hong Kong and grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has a BA in English literature from Stanford an MFA in fiction from the University of Montana. She has work forthcoming in fiction Attic Press and is the editorial director at Submittable in Missoula, Montana. And finally, we have Tim O'Leary. And since starting his first software company at age 22, Tim has founded more than a dozen companies, primarily centered in the technology, advertising, and entertainment space. He is the co-founder and chairman of the R2C Group, one of the nation's largest privately held advertising agencies. His nonfiction book on management, Warriors, Workers, and Whiners, was released in 2006, and his stories and essays have appeared in many publications. Raised in Montana, he graduated from the University of Montana and received his MFA from Pacific University. He serves on the board of the Freshwater Trust, the Wild Salmon Center, and is a trustee emeritus for the University of Montana. He resides in Portland, Oregon, and Santa Inez, California. Because this panel is directly focused on the workplace, I think the, um, the first question I'm, I'm going to ask is one that I'm going to ask to the uh, the employers, people who are are um, looking at candidates' qualifications, what do you look for, and how do you uh, identify the best candidate for the positions you offer? Can start with you, Brian. Okay. So, um, Close. my business is a bit of. I mean, we're a we're a very small enterprise, and we basically. Uh, we're not part of any kind of, I mean, we're constantly like needing to write up so many materials, whether it's letters or itinerary descriptions or content to support those things. So when I'm looking for to hire almost anybody that's not a, a technical, um, with the, that I'm not looking for maybe a, a coder or something, almost anybody else I'm looking for, I want to know that they can communicate with me in th through the written word. And so the first thing I look at in any application is the cover letter. 
And sometimes, oftentimes, I will never move on to the resume itself if the cover letter does not um, speak directly to me and speak to me in a manner that um, you know is efficient and directed and and um, shows me that they know who I am um, when they write that letter. So that that's probably a, one of the principal ways that I I do an initial evaluation of somebody. Um, I I'll kind of deal with I think it'd be. Uh most helpful to kind of talk about the advertising business and how we hire writers in the advertising business. Uh, that'd be probably of most interest to people. There are um, there are two kind of career paths for a writer in the advertising business. One is to be freelance per the uh, earlier seminar, and one is to be a staff writer. Um, your entry point could into advertising could be a, a number of different ways. Uh, we bring in uh, interns. Um, a, a lot of times they have they come from a from a creative writing background or a communications background, and they can kind of work their way through the organization. Uh, if you're going to take the freelance path, um, you need to align yourself with other freelancers who kind of know that world. It's it's a, a very unusual business in that I don't get a resume and a a um, it, it, it's kind of not done that way. You you will for sort of the full-time positions, but most advertising writers start, start out in the freelance world because that's, that's just the sort of easiest point of entry. And, um, and then there's a whole hierarchy of you typically are starting writing for a small local agency, uh, which does not pay much and is difficult, and then you kind of elevate to maybe a mid-sized agency, and if you're lucky, then you get to work on national campaigns. Um, and so the life of an advertising copywriter is, is uh, you know, starting out very basic. And if you make your way to the very top echelons of the industry, it's an incredibly lucrative, and um, uh, an incredibly lucrative business. Uh, so when you when you talk to people in the business, they either make no money or they may, might make all kinds of money. Uh, but it is a uh, it is a world of connections, and so as a freelancer. You are making yourself available. You are visiting creative departments. Uh, you're looking for areas of specialization. Um, so much like um, a, a writer for a magazine, we might have a client. Uh, for instance, we work in healthcare a lot. So if you have a background of writing for healthcare, that's incredibly important. Or we might have a, a fitness client, or or um, you know vacuum cleaners. Who knows? Uh, but having a background in those kinds of things, kind of coming up with a, a point of differentiation and, and expertise is, is very valuable. And then you start to build um, what we call build the real. And um, uh, we do a lot of television work and a lot of online work. And so uh, you're going in and you're pitching, you're pitching that. One of the unique things about uh, advertising writing is that you know, many of you here are, are hoping, like, I'm, I'm going to be an author and I'm going to be known for my kind of work. When you work in the advertising business, you're going to work as part of a team. And so your ability to kind of interact with the team and understand that you're one little cog within the team. Um, and what will happen is that as you form relationships, maybe you've worked with a producer or a director that really liked working with you, then they're going to bring you work. And so your ability to work as a team member really advances your career and becomes real important in, in sort of the big scope of things. If you can't work with other people, uh, then it's, it's, not a good, it's not a good fit. Can I answer that Absolutely. as well, actually? Yes. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur, but the entrepreneur I work for doesn't hire people anymore. I hire the people. Um, and so um, I love what you're saying about um, I won't even get to the resume if I'm not in love with the cover letter. I also won't necessarily get to the resume if I am in love with the cover letter. I will just call you and um, then learn about you in an interview. Um, a lot of times, I think one time I've hired my standout person from resume to interview, and there are not really that many perfect standouts. So you kind of then you go on to your maybes, and I've always hired the maybes. And, I think even when I did hire the favorite person, like actually I know this, when I did hire the favorite person, I regretted it and luckily that ended. Um, but my maybes are amazing and it's that, it's who, who's the best communicator, who can work in a team and if I'm adding you to my team, I want you to be like 
an addition to the team, not the most talented person who's going to be a dick um, <laughs> for like, um, or anything like that. You know, it's like who's going to be there, who's going to support other people, who's going to bring the best out in other people, and that's um, that's who I've hired, and it's like made my job more enjoyable, and I think everybody else that I work with. Uh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm not an entrepreneur either, but um, I, I do help with recruiting and hiring at Submittable. Um, and in terms of the cover letter, I think uh, one thing that I I notice is that a lot of times people, when they write their cover letters, because they think that they're writing to you know a business, they like feel like they need to use a lot of syllables and sound very professional. Um, and that's kind of I don't know, off-putting, I think, um, especially. So our company, um, Submittable, was founded by one of the MFA graduates here, Michael Fitzgerald. Um, and so he's a fiction writer. And so he very much appreciates you know, the art of writing. Um, and I think that one thing to keep in mind is just to sound like a human in your letter. Uh, you know, don't sound like a robot, because that's just kind of, yeah, we're, we're not into the business speak. Um, I would like to ask you to think about how you would advise um, someone who's graduating, going to go out and apply for jobs, how would you advise them to research the companies that they want to work for and the jobs they want to do? How do they come up with that idea that I want to be an assistant to this because of that? How do they get there? Does anybody else want to start? Go ahead. Well, Adventure Life is such a small company with 20-some people that you start where you start and you kind of move laterally more than up. Um, so I guess if someone is looking for, if they're looking for the kind of jobs that I'm offering, um, they tend to be somebody who is going to be interested in international travel, inter interested in other cultures, and particularly interested in sharing um, experiences with other people. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand the f what you're, how you're formulating your question. Um, and I maybe I think of, of an ideal candidate for us as someone who has decided they want to work in, um, they want to work in an industry where they get to share experiences with other people, experiences that they're excited about, and someone who really enjoys um, a, sort of a constant level of communicating, both um, orally and um, and in the written word. Um, and they would, I'm, I'm thinking how they would, typically people find our jobs by actually getting onto adventure travel industry websites um, and discovering that the, the industry exists um, and thinking that they want to be something, they want to be a part of it um, beyond the guiding part of it, because that's uh, sort of the, the beginning part that people think about. Um, I guess I'd say one more thing is we often start people in um, administrative positions um, or they start in some other sort of entry level position. They're doing some sort of either general admin, which can be a whole host of anything from data entry to, to actually um, engaging with uh, trip research, uh, or we start them in some other um, fulfillment um, or, or area of sales that we can train them fairly efficiently in. But if we discover that that person really has um, other skills that were hard to identify in a cover letter or resume or during the interview, then we will move them into higher levels of responsibility. And actually, everybody in a senior level in my company started in some um, more basic administrative position. Uh, and when there were new challenges that the company faced, they stood up and said, I can do that uh, and put the time in to do that. And so we were able to identify that they had um, other talents that we could really utilize. And, and I get a lot of people who don't want to step up and, um, and show us that they can do that. And that's okay because we have, um, you know, we have a lot of, we don't have senior level positions for everybody. But in terms of sort of that career path, um, you step in the door somehow, especially if you want to be stay around Missoula or in a smaller community where you're going to have smaller businesses. You step through the door in one capacity with the idea that you're more capable than that and you're going to show your employer that you can do that. And I think oftentimes um, those opportunities then will, will open up for you. In, in the advertising world, we, t we tend to get uh, creatives that come from two paths. The first path are people that don't really want to work in advertising and they think it's an evil, dark place, but they want the money. And uh, 
Uh, they tend to be freelancers, and they are most effective when they have a, like I talked about earlier, an area of specialization that make them, makes them quite appealing to us. So it would be a, a certain kind of work that we would seek out. Either they know a lot about a category, they, um, you know, they are mountaineers and we have a mountaineering client, whatever that might be. Um, and the second category you get are people that actually love advertising uh, as, as a real creative format. And um, those people tend to go into it full time. I, I don't like it when somebody that wants it as their day job comes in full time because they're generally unhappy and I don't want them to be unhappy. Um, but you get a lot of people now, and especially in sort of this sort of post Mad Men uh, thing, you get a lot of people that are like, this is the great, and they study it as if it were literature and they have all kinds of ideas and um, they're willing to kind of work their way through the career path. And then that becomes a full-time thing. And, and, and literally, they, they usually are starting a little bit as freelancers, and then they work their way through the process. Um, and in the earlier seminar, people talked about working for nothing. The advertising business is a, a business where you do all kinds of things for free, and then if you get the account, you charge the hell out of them. And so that happens a lot uh, with the freelance world, too. But what I caution people about is that um, some pretty low-end agencies will want you to work for free. We never expect uh, a creative to work for free. We will pay them, and we will, we will take the hit, even though we might not be getting paid in a pitch. Um, and you kind of want to seek out those people because there is, uh, it's a very volatile world at certain levels, and, and so you have to be careful about that. Uh, but we will have people. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing, if you're, if you're going to work in the advertising world, is that you need to understand commerce as well as your art. And so you have to understand something about business. The, the worst writers are the ones that, that, that do not understand business, and they get very, very picky when they have to work as part of the team because they don't want the font on the screen in, in light green. They want it dark green, and they go crazy and disrupt the whole thing. So... Um, that's the other thing we look for as people kind of work through the ranks. If they're a real team player, that's, that's not to say that you shouldn't have a great creative uh, drive and be willing to fight for your position. We really like that, but we, we don't want too much, too much disruption. Thank you. I think in terms of, um, if you want flexibility in your career as a writer, uh, I would definitely consider working for a startup. Uh, that's because there's just so much flexibility to move between roles. Uh, in terms of my background, I so I graduated in 03 from undergrad, and then I, I worked at Google for five years, uh, and I started out there in customer support, and then I worked um, my way to uh, doing search engine marketing, and then um, I became a corporate trainer, and that was just invaluable to me in terms of my career um, and having different skill sets to work with. Um, and one thing that I really like about Submittable um, is, you know, we're very much a startup. So um, even though my title is editorial director, I get to, you know, not only write content, but also help out with hiring and, um, you know, just sort of any kind of project that is interesting to me, I can sort of dive into. And I think that that's really valuable as a writer because you're always looking for experiences anyways um, to write about, right? Um, and it's also just really fun. So I think if you're looking for growth, uh, look for a startup. And Resume.submittable.com. <laughs> <laughs> really, I would I would back up the startup thing and and going off of what you're saying about adventure life, um, just go in with find something that you're interested in and want to be a part of. And at startups, yeah, you they grow really easily, and you're not necessarily going to be promoted into a position that already exists, but you'll just do more and more, and then your name will change, your title will change, um, and that's that's true for us at SciShow, like. My job didn't exist until I had it. I just promoted people into two jobs that we made up um, because they were just already taking that initiative and doing more things. And so I was like, oh, well, I can lean on them harder. We should have their title and their pay like reflect what we're asking them to do and or what they're already doing. And then we can be like, ha, now you just have to keep doing that. Um, and then, But also I would say when you're excited about something that's growing and you're wanting to be a part of it, um, be humble. Um, I have been fired 
many times by people that I'm interviewing for a job. They're like, I want to have your job. And I'm like, okay, well, no, uh, I have my job. Um, and so, or they're like, well, could we do it like this? And don't like restructure the company around you. Like see where you could fit in and where you could make a place for yourself. But don't think that you're going to go in and take it by storm because the people you're wanting to work with have a decent idea of what they're doing and they want your help, but they don't want you to take over. So. I think it was uh, Forbes magazine that put out the three primary elements that they were looking for. I mean, that uh, uh, um, entre business people are looking for in new hires. That was uh, communication, teamwork, and writing. Those three abilities topped the list. In every category of business, those were the three primary uh, wants that were out there. And so I guess, you know, coming from um, the point of view of people who are going to be applying for jobs, who are looking for jobs, what would be what you would consider some of the biggest errors they could make or biggest red flags that you would see as employers or as coworkers or even perhaps your own experiences in applying and then learning later uh, the error of your ways? I like to hire happy people. So um, I like to have, that's probably the first thing we look for is a happy person. Um, I also like to hire people that are very polite and very friendly. And that's probably the second thing I look for. And uh, we actually get people who call in to the office to ask a question about their, their application or we call them to schedule an interview. And they sound like they maybe just woke up on a Saturday morning after a tough Friday. And so that's pretty much a red flag, and we don't go further. So for, for that, and that's maybe why we've managed to get, um, be successful with like getting recognized as being a great place to work is because we, my first thing I'm looking for is a happy person. I'm gonna work with you every single day. And I have a crew of people that I find that are very dear to me, and I want um, them to enjoy working with you. I want to enjoy working with you. So that's, that's the first one. Um, you know, I still get cover letters with with uh, grammar errors in them. Um, I hate to dear hiring committee because I don't have anywhere on my on my job announcements that say to apply to the hiring committee. Um, so there's some details that I think are are really key when you go to apply for a job. I, I don't think it, it, whether you're in the freelance arena and you're trying to build up a network of contacts and get somebody to hire you and you're pitching, or whether you're you're going for a, 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 an introductory um, administrative job, you, you really need to you know cross your T's, dot your I's, and know who it is that you are talking to. I, I think just, that's just a, for me that's such a key thing. Who is it that's going to be receiving your application um, and and put yourself in their shoes and think to yourself what is it that you think they're looking for and address those things um, because if you don't address me directly and address what I'm looking for directly um, and if it's too generic or or something of that nature it tells me so many things about you um, that you'll probably not be successful getting your foot through the door I'm reminded Mike kids when they were coming through high school got part-time jobs and every one of them was successful if they you know when they applied for a job if they put uh, raised on a ranch because of the implication that might not have been true mind you but the implication that they knew how to work hard and you know were task oriented like little golden retrievers or something <laughs> Uh, I would kind of echo something that was said earlier. One, one of the problems we see is that uh, applicants won't have properly researched who we are, what we do, what the culture is like. And um, I'm amazed at that they'll misspell names. They'll, they'll um, um, you know, if it comes into whom it may concern, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to get an interview. Uh, but secondarily, uh, to, to be, you know, well informed about the company and to uh, not try to tell them how to run the company. Um, I, I had an Uber driver apply for a job the other day. I was, uh, I was picked up at the airport. I'm going back to the office and the Uber driver knew the company and he said, I'm, a, I'm an MBA student and I'd like, a, I'd like to work at your agency. And, uh, and then he began to tell me what was wrong with the agency. 
length and in detail. Um, and he had, had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. I'm amazed at the number of people we get that, that, that kind of come in and they have a, uh, unwarranted opinions. Uh, the other thing that you should be uh, aware of, uh, of, of people of my generation, we are, we are very, uh, we are very sensitive about the entitled young person coming in, whether it's true or not. Um, if you want to work in the advertising business, it is grueling. And um, it, is, it is not a work-life balance kind of scenario. Um, don't work in it. You know, you have a choice. You don't have to come in. So uh, the way it kind of works is that you will work really, really hard for two, three, four months. And then you kind of have a down month. And, and we don't care. And, um, and the trade-off is the environment. You know, you can, you know, once you're established, you can bring your dog to work. And if we trust you, you, you can, you can, if we know that you like to write between, you know, 9 p.m. and midnight, that's fine. But you have to earn that trust. But when we get applicants in that are very, very concerned with, with the work-life balance issues, and that's fine. You can, you can be concerned with that. You just can't be concerned in our business. Um, and uh, you can be concerned in other businesses. That is a really, really common scenario we face a lot. And um, um, then the, the, the final thing on the communication, um, I, I think that as you get, you know, as you get workshopped and you get your work cut down and you, you have a 5,000 word piece that has to go to 2,000 words, that's really great training for what we do. That's what we want. I, I, want, I want a short, snappy letter that shows how intelligent you are. I, uh, I, I want a, a resume that isn't too blustery. I want to see some of your work that, that's your best work, uh, but I don't want it to be um, a, a, an opus. And um, because we don't we don't have that luxury, I'd like to se I'd like to second that because in the travel business we're constantly selling, so we're constantly marketing, and advertising is a really big part of what we do on a daily, um, momentary basis. And so I don't want to see lo long letters. In fact, the best class I probably took in university was a class where um, the professor didn't allow any term paper to be more than one page long, single-spaced. And if it, you went into the margins where you weren't supposed to, then he'd actually knocked you down for that. And that was probably the best training I had because we deal with that as well all the time that s we're constantly trying to get people in the office who are writing letters or writing copy of some kind to trim their work to actually be purposeful and have a, have a strong impact. And it's, it's, that's one of the things we struggle with the most is. What about the 40 hour work week, the comment you made earlier about? Yeah, if you want to work hard. <laughs> um, yeah, we, in Missoula, we, I think maybe because it's a lifestyle choice place maybe, um, we have, we're challenged to find people that want to work more than 40 hours a week. Um, we pay, um, we're, most of my employees are paid hourly, so they get paid overtime, um, time and a half if they work hourly. So I'll happily pay for 45 or 50 hour work weeks. Um, but typically, even if I have a new project that we're working with, that may be a new area of business that we can get into, um, I can't ask for more than maybe an hour or two extra of, um, of a, on a 40 hour work week from almost anybody. And um, <laughs> I don't, if I have somebody who steps up and says, hey, I'll do that, I'll put in that extra 10 hours for the next four months while this project gets, gets um, launched, they probably just secured themselves a new position in the company heading up that project, so. Um, go, going back to the ranch conversation, uh, or the comment, um, I think a standout for me is someone who wants to be an idea person. Um, that's just a person is an idea person. Like if you, if you want to be an idea person, like then tell me like how hard of a worker you are. Like never be like, oh, I'm really great at conceptualizing things. Be like, oh, I'm really good at getting things done. Like I'm good at teamwork. I'm good at work. I'm good at working. That's what I want to know about. Um, and you can have great ideas, but follow that up by how, how hard you work at them. Um, and also, uh, yes, know the gender of the person you're addressing your letter to. Um, you will usually get an email be from me back if you misgender me, because uh, I just want you to be like, I'm a woman. Um, but I won't call you in for an interview. Um, and, uh, but also don't um, caricaturize the company that you're wanting to work with either. Um, I work in nerd culture, um, but I don't get your Doctor Who joke when you send me your cover letter. If it's like in a, a clever language, I don't get it. I'm a, I have work to do, I'm sorry. And so, um, so I, 
just like be honest and present your personality, but don't assume that we have the exact same personality. Um, so that would be my, my red flags. Um, we like to uh, hire people who are smarter than we are, um, but also humility I think is a big thing. So that's kind of rare, right? To be really intelligent and also very humble, but but it's out there. Um, and also just very kind people. I think that um, we're very lucky at Submittable. I know I sound like an advertisement for it, but I, <laughs> I, I genuinely really enjoy working there. And um, our founders are just some of the kindest, very intelligent, very kind people that I've had the pleasure of working for. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, from the day that you step into the office, you know, not just how you talk to the people who will be interviewing you, but the people who, you know, walk you over to the interview area and all that kind of good stuff, you know, just um, we, we do keep an eye on how you treat people and, um, you know, are you a nice person? Because I think that that's pretty important. Um, and also, we actually really like it when people have s interesting backgrounds. Um, like we have, and if you have a passion, I think that's very interesting, or if you've done something in unusual. Um, we have someone who did improv um, in Chicago um, to another person who, in sales, who he was like an Olympic caliber ski mogul champion. <laughs> you know, it's just a really interesting people with interesting drives, because I think that that can translate over into your work as well. I mean, go back to that too also um if you are not hired by a company it's not because you're not really good at what you do but it's probably because you don't fit in with that culture that they've created and it's good for companies to be protective of that culture that they've created and if you are not going to fit with that that's probably really good for you also so just use that as like a barometer i guess to pick out where you want to go after next I, I think that's a great point. And the, the other thing I would say is if you don't get the job, how you handle that gracefully is incredibly important because we might not have just had the perfect position for you, but we might have really liked you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we might be thinking, we're going to hire them in three months or I know the right kind of company and I'm going to send this person. If you don't send a nice thank you letter or if you're snippy with, with the HR people, you have just, you blow in that. And, and so you have to think about your personal brand the entire time. And, and even if you don't get the job, it's like, well, I'm, I'm laying little seeds of my brand. Uh, the other thing I was going to comment on that is uh, a lot of people are incredibly reliant on the social networking tools. So, um, so on my LinkedIn page, for instance, under comments, I say, please do not contact me to sell goods or apply to the company because I don't make any decisions in any of those kinds of things. And I'm very specific. Nobody ever reads it, and every day I get five to 15 solicitations, and they're these horrible solicitations like, um, hey, could we have coffee next week? And, you know, th that kind of thing. It doesn't work that way, and, uh, and it's creepy, sort of. And then they, uh, and then when you don't respond, they keep coming at you, and then pretty soon you have to take them off your list, and then you have a stalker. Um, so um, I'm not saying don't use those social networking tools because they can be very, very valuable, uh, but you have to kind of use them judiciously and not slam somebody over the head because they've accepted your friend request. And a, a lot of people do that, and then, then you, you don't want them. You know, you don't want to have that. A and also being... I'm, I'm a big fly fisherman, so what will happen is an applicant will hear that and they will send me a letter about their love of fly fishing. And then I read it and I realize they've never fly fished in their life. Uh, that is the wrong, that is the wrong, whatever your interest is. And we are very interested in people that have unique abilities and that if they're skiers or if they're photographers, that's wonderful. But don't lie about it because uh, you're, you're going to get caught. <laughs> I just make a quick comment about perseverance as well. Uh, it, it, just because you don't get hired the first time doesn't mean you won't get hired the second time or the third time if the, because the, the right job might open up. And so my general manager, um, my, the most senior person in my company, applied three times before I hired him. So it's not, there is something to be said for perseverance as well. But he didn't hide the fact that he, that he applied three times either, and I appreciate that too. So he'd remind me I applied for another this job or a similar job three months ago or whatever. So I think being both honest and, per, being per, and persevering is, is important as well. No, I um, what is the uh, thin line between being persistent and being a stalker when it comes to <laughs> um, 
I mean, there's the don't take no for an answer sort of uh, pull yourself up and get out there and in, especially in job markets that are perceived to be difficult to find work, uh, entry level positions. Uh, is it uh, entirely hopeless or, I mean, is it like a cattle call out there or? I, I personally don't like to feel like I've just been put on some mass distribution list of, you know, getting hit over the head all the time. So I think you have to be careful about that. What I do appreciate is um, you can regularly communicate, but that is not on a daily or weekly basis. So if you're truly interested in working for the company and you have something interesting to say, if I get an email from someone and they say, gee, I just saw this commercial you guys did and it was wonderful and I just did this and it might be of interest to you, then that's good. Um, or periodically checking in in a, in a, in a very nice way. Um, but don't push for a meeting, um, you know, unless there's a, an, an opening. Don't don't uh, don't like gee can we have coffee don't get um, some people get kind of snippy like I, I you can't imagine the number of things like listen I've applied four times and I don't understand why you won't give me uh, an interview well you just answered your question uh, so um, I think I think showing genuine friendly interest and kind of keeping up with the company and being fairly current so that you can you say oh these people really do want to work with us I think that's fine Um, also, I'd say uh, don't be too easily discouraged uh, because we're a startup. You know, we're kind of constantly well doing all these different things, and so sometimes if we've interviewed you and you haven't heard back from us in a few weeks, um, it's definitely okay to email back to check in because sometimes we've just sort of you know you've kind of gone off the radar, but it doesn't mean that we don't care or that we don't want to follow up with you. It's just sometimes startups get a little crazy, so so be a, a little bit persistent at least. Oh, the one more thing I would say is uh, be aware of how the, the company is actually hiring people. We send recruiters to this campus twice a year, yet I will get people that will contact me and say, how would I get a job? And I'm like, well, maybe you could meet with the recruiters when we're in town. So um, kind of be aware of that because there could be things going on that would make your life a lot easier. I think we want to call for questions now. If any, um Young people out there, soon to be entrepreneurs, have questions? <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> you go ahead, you go first. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so what about older people who might feel interested in getting into writing and also might be interested in, because time is short and heart, attack, heart attacks are around the corner, interested in a life-work balance. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, is there a place, um, perhaps freelancing, where you can craft a, a life that um, you're still submitting good work, you're being friendly, you're, you know, all of the things that you mentioned, but you don't want to work yourself into an earlier grave than you might want. Uh, yeah, so I, I hire full-time people, um, but we very heavily rely on a lot of freelance writers that our full-time writers braid together and edit and, and make our channels with. And um, there are some writers that I hear from and interact with constantly and there are some writers that we only call for certain things and it's really just um, and and when we have good writers we love them because they're so like good writers who are smart and can learn fast and explain things well and answer like their email um, are amazing and um, so yeah just like keeping that communication open like um, they're earlier on the panel they were saying yes say yes to everything um, but for us we we get in this position where um, people kind of like pick their favorites like maybe you only want to write about space maybe you only want to write about brain science like psychology like ours are all science based but um, maybe you want to write for kids like that's we can kind of like work with you that way and 
our writers are all over the world, so it's just like keeping that communication open, like let us know when you're going to be gone, just being really, really communicative so that um, we don't forget about you if you do want to have less, um, less hours than other people. But, yeah. I didn't mean to come down so hard on life-work balance because <laughs> if, you, if you do want to have life-work balance, and I think anybody that wants it should have it, uh, freelance is, is a great option. Um, and, um, and if you are an older writer uh, and you want to write in advertising, then what you want to do is seek out agencies that have clients that, that are in your demographic. Advertising is often thought of a very young person's field, but we, uh, we for instance, do a lot in, like Humana Healthcare is a client, and we work with a lot of kind of older demographic kinds of things, and we, what we much prefer uh, older creatives working on that. And to the extent that you could craft a freelance career that could get very specific and put you in demand. So for instance, if I'm doing pharmaceutical advertising, that is very specific. Uh, primarily because you have to inform people at the end of the ad that the product causes anal leakage. And there's no <laughs> nice way to say that. Uh, so uh, having a writer that can finesse that, so it's like making anal leakage beautiful, uh, <laughs> that's nice. So you advertise for kink.com. Okay. Um, now, the, uh, what about uh, the learning curve for, uh, mm, for administrative tools? Like I'm reminded of, uh, I'm reminded of the movie uh, Love and Death on Long Island where John Hurt plays a, uh, a very celebrated writer and he's doing a ra radio show and they say, do you use a word processor? And he's like, I I'm a writer. I don't process words. The guy couldn't tell a toaster oven from a VCR. And so the idea is... When you, if you have the talent, you have the personality, everything is great on the paperwork, and you hire them, and you say, okay, and on Wednesdays by three o'clock, you have your TPS reports done. Great. What's a TPS report? You don't know. Is like I'm, I'm a writer. I write. Uh, any, anything else? Uh, I don't know. So there's all this documentation and paperwork and. Uh, stuff that has to be done when you get brought on and if you're completely unfamiliar with them because again you're a writer you didn't go to business school what what kind of problems can that cause or uh, what what kind of what kind of stuff do people need to know going in that may not be on the the letterhead or the masthead of the website that says oh by the way make sure you know how you know C++ before you apply that kind of thing Well, I definitely think that it's important to be resourceful um, for any applicant. Uh, I mean, we do have a lot of, you know, um, internal tools that we use at work, um, and some that people might not be familiar with. But as long as you're a quick learner and you're willing to sort of work to learn how to do it, I don't think that that would be an issue. Um, it's more about just sort of going out and learning it yourself. Or, well, I think in a startup, especially, there might not be um, some sort of formal training process, you know. And so we definitely look for people who. Um, are very flexible and sort of good at learning on their own. Um, I guess, unfortunately, in today's world, technology is pervasive all around us. So I, 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 I would actually have to say that I kind of expect that people can use um, the basic tools of technology, whether they know um, a particular program versus another. Um, you know, that's that's fine, but they should be pretty proficient before they start working for us because we're small. We don't have a formal training program for you. If you don't know how to use um, the the basics of Excel or the basics of, of working in a with a with a Word document, then that's going to be an issue. And typically in our job um, announcements, we if you need to know um, Adobe Photoshop or something like that for that particular position, we will put that in. But for sure, if you do know those things coming in and you're looking to do some, some, you know, it's an administrative position that you hope to do some writing and do more and more writing with, if you can do other programs besides word processing programs like Photoshop or um, then we're going to be really excited about that because we need we have so many needs like Asta has mentioned I mean as a, as a small company you're you're constantly looking to do new things and all the Facebook posts and the social media postings and the blogs and things like that if you can modify a, a, photo, a photograph then not only are you a resource as a writer, but you're a resource in terms of the different mediums that are available and that are and the things that are required to, to utilize that writing. 
So I guess I would say that in our position. Uh, yeah, um, yeah I, I tend to agree with that. And, it, and the, I think that you can be really honest, though. You're like, oh, well, I'm not as familiar with this. I just had a meeting with a host and a writer who I work with all the time and absolutely love. And she always, always, always sends me PDFs of scripts that then I have to edit. And so I'm like, please just share a Google Doc with me. And she doesn't know how. So we had to sit down. And like, that's a rare case because I everyone else I work with, like, we're a Google related company. Like, we have to do everything that that everybody can work on it. And so, but I love her and she was honest and I helped her figure that out so it made our lives easier. Um, the most important thing to me is that you know how to research and you know how to cite your sources and you are very, 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 very sure about what is plagiarized and what is not. Um, and so that stuff is so golden and kind of falling by the wayside if you like are like wanting to be a writer and you actually haven't studied writing um, that that stuff is like champion how like honest you are and how eager you are to learn and be eager to learn new programs and things like that and and always always ask questions if you're ever in doubt we, we find that the more technologically proficient you are the more we're going to like you uh, that being said um, really to be a copywriter you just have to be familiar with word and I'm not talking like word 93 it should be a current <laughs> Okay. Um, and you, you would ask, uh, is there a script format that you like? And we'll give you a script format. That being said, sometimes I get somebody that comes in and they are, they, they visualize past the word and they'll present like a storyboard with illustrations and done in some strange computer program I've never seen before. And it's, it can be magnificent and it really gives them a, a leg up. So. Uh, what you don't want to do is create uh, a burden. So I've had writers who are like, well, I'm writing from a cabin and my email is not very good. And well, that is not, a, you know, then let's not work together. Um, but, uh, but you, you know, you don't have to be a technological genius as long as you're really talented. But the, the, the better you are, uh, the easier it will be. We have time for one more question. Uh, I just wanted to ask about copywriting. I keep on, uh, like, how do you make sure you're, you know, like you're not plagiarizing? Because it seems like there's this, there's this, I mean, I, you know, anyways, you guys know my, my question, right? I have built my career plagiarizing. And uh, <laughs> no, there, there, are, there are very few uh, new ideas. That being said, um, you do get sued um, uh, if you, are too close. I've had clients sued. We have sued um, for things like um, I, I, I had a client sued because of the way a guy took his shirt off in the advertisement. Um, and the, the other company said that that was a, um, a trademark <laughs> aspect of how, how you would make this move. Um, but, um, you, you, you know, especially in copywriting, you are chasing current culture. So it's, it's very unusual that you will come up with something that, that, that's not been done before. But there are different kind of copywriters. We do, we do a lot of what I call portraiture ads, which somebody with a, a poetry background is better for, because you're just looking at beautiful work, and, and, and then the words have to match that. Um, but um, the, the danger is if I present to a client and they go, well, that looks just like that. Then you're then you've lost your trust, and so th there is that balance. But um, but you are we're all kind of pulling from the same well. Um, so by if you are using one source, you're plagiarizing. Um, if if you don't understand the content that you're presenting, then you're in unsafe waters. Um, if you are pulling from lots of lots of sources and you are learning the, about the material, and then it's you explaining what you have learned, then I feel like you're good. And then you cite those sources that you've used, um, and that's yes, yeah, cite all your sources, um, and look into what sources they cite too, because you want to be sure that that you're not working on on unsteady unsteady ground. Um, 
and that I want to say something about trademarks um, that I've learned recently that uh, um, to protect a trademark, you have to sue. So, um, so that's if somebody trademarked that, if they let that go, then then it's no longer trademarked, and so it's that's why people are. Mm -hmm. It seems ridiculous, but um, but that's they have to protect their trademark. So that's why you have to be careful about things like that. One more question. Um, sorry. Earlier, you talked about how if you've applied three times, don't email and be like, "Why am I not in your company yet?" Um, how would you go about? I guess if I like really felt like I belonged in your company, how what would be a good way to say I'm ready to adapt and change because I really want to be a part of your company without being too aggressive? Um, what, what I notice is that the people that form nice relationships with the decision makers um, and, and it often is, it's, it's, it's a year or two. I'll talk to HR, our HR people and they'll say, hey, um, we've got this person, they've been, hanging, they've been hanging around for a year or two, and we think they're really ready. They, worked, they went to work at a smaller agency, and they got some good experience there, and um, we have the right kind of opening. So I think you can nicely stay in touch without being a stalker, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with sending some work over. Um, you know, listen, I did this freelance thing, and, or I, I did go to work for these guys. We often get people that will apply, and we don't think they're ready, and they'll go to work for somebody else for a year or two, and then they stay, and, and I think that's just fine. I think that, that's really what you should be doing. And it could be a manager, too, not only the HR person, but if there is a, a creative director that you're going to work under, then you can kind of stay in touch with them. We're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you guys for helping us understand.